Welcome to ePartshala for PG courses. We are looking at a series of uh, lectures on computer networks. Uh, we have been looking at application layer protocols. So, in the previous lecture, we had looked at um, email and how the SMTP protocol is used for email. So, what we will look at is in today's uh, lecture is that we will uh, take a look at some of the supporting protocols that are used along with SMTP along with some of the details of um, extensions that are there to SMTP as well. So, as we said um, earlier, the SMTP protocol is a ASCII based protocol that is all messages are sent only as 7 bit ASCII messages. So, the question that comes up here is if I want to send a message which is non ASCII then how do I send it? For instance, we are sending images, audio, video files and so on. So, all these are non ASCII uh, files. So, how do I send such non ASCII files? Because SMTP protocol will only handle 7 bit ASCII messages. So, how do we handle this? So, to handle this what is normally done is that we need to convert this non ASCII code into a 7 bit ASCII code. So, we again have some standards which help us to do that. The standard that is used for this purpose is called as MIME uh, which stands for multipurpose internet mail extension. So, we use this MIME extension to convert non ASCII codes to 7 bit ASCII format. Okay. So, MIME is the um, code you can look at it as an uh, code conversion mechanism. Of course, MIME also has other details to it, but what we are concerned about here is the code conversion part of MIME. So, what happens actually is that when you have any non ASCII file or non ASCII uh, data that needs to be sent, it is put through the MIME, convert into 7 bit ASCII and once it is converted to 7 bit ASCII, it can be sent through the SMTP protocol using the SMTP protocol and again on the other side MIME will convert it back into the non ASCII whatever was the original format. So, let us look at how MIME does this. So, uh, one of the simple um, ideas that is used in MIME is what is called as the base 64 encoding. So, remember that base 64 stands for um, 64 stands for 2 power 6. So, when we talk about base 64 we are talking about encoding characters in 6 bit format. Okay, so, when you say it is a base 64 encoding, it is a 6 bit format that we are trying to encode the data in. So, what we do here is when you have non ASCII data, so you can look at non ASCII data as just a series of uh, bits of zeros and ones. So, you take this series of bits of zeros and ones and take 6 bits at a time, okay, so take 6 bits out of this at a time and convert that into an equivalent ASCII character. Okay, so, this is what is our base 64 converter doing over here. So, we have say for instance, if I have 24 bits of non ASCII data, there are 3 a uh, 3 bytes for instance. So, I take 6 6 bits out of this. So, the first 6 bits are taken here 111001 converted which is which corresponds to 57 which is converted to a value of 5. Similarly, the next 6 bits over here 000100. So, starting from here to this right. So, these the 2 bits from here and 6 bits from here. Similarly, the next uh, 6 bits um, 4 bits from here and 2 bits from here. So, that forms the third character and the last 4 bits are taken from here to form the fourth character. So, like this you can see that these are all 6 bit characters which, are now can, which can, can now be coded into 7 bit ASCII format and so the equivalent character encoding that we get for this will be z small z i e 5 and so on. So, this is basically the idea that is used in MIME you use this base 64 encoding. Um, there are other encodings which could be used but base 64 encoding is the um, one that is uh, popularly used in MIME. Okay. So, if you look at um, how this MIME information is sent along with the data uh, along with the data as part of the SMTP protocol. There are some additional header lines that are added to indicate that MIME has been used and that some kind of encoding has been used along with MIME. Okay. So, if you look at the additional headers that you see you will find that now we already we have already seen there is a there will be a from header there will be a to uh, header line and there will be a subject header line. In addition to that now we have three or um, three additional header lines as such one is called the MIME version which indicates that I am using MIME and you are mentioning the version of the protocol that is being used. Uh, then you have something called content transfer encoding and you say colon base 64. So, this base 64 is the type of encoding that is being used okay, that is also specified. Then we talk about the content type what is the type of content that is actually being sent which has been encoded using base 64. So, for instance it could be image slash JPEG. So, it is an image file in JPEG format which has now been converted into base 64 data. So, this encoded data is will follow this as part of the actual data right. So, this is basically what we have as part of the multimedia um, header lines uh, uh, multimedia MIME extension header lines. Okay. So, um, looking further now when you have different um, for instance you may have just 
one attachment as part will along with your with your uh, male as being sent or there may be multiple attachments in which case each of them could be different types of files one could be an audio file one could be an image file one could be a video file and so on so each of this then um, the the content type would be different right for each of these things so in those cases we use what is called as a multi part mixed um, type in the content type so if you look at this you see that mime version shows 1.0 content type is given as multi part slash mixed this indicates that there are multiple paths to this to this message and you have a mix of different types of um, content that are being sent as part of this mail so then you all so when you have different types of content being sent you need to also have some kind of a boundary which indicates where a particular type ends and the other type begins right so you normally have something called a boundary line boundary start so say let's say some character some 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 which is used as the separator for the different parts of the messages okay so when a when a particular uh, content type starts you will see that it starts with this particular boundary line so you'll have a uh, hyphen hyphen start 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 which is that boundary indicator this will be followed by the content type that is used for that particular part so in this case for instance it could be text slash plain character set us ascii so this tells me what is the character set that's being used what is the content and what is the format for this particular part so then this will have some plain binary stuff okay so that is what you will have as part of this message so this may be followed by for instance again another start line start 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 which indicates that i have another part so now i say here content type is image slash gif name is file dot gif for instance file name is given and then content transfer encoding base 64 so remember that because it is a non ascii content i'll have to specify a transfer encoding so it's specified here as base 64 then you could have other fields like content description content disposition and so on followed by the mime or base 64 encoded data then again there could be another part so again i'll have a start okay and then again a content type for instance it says audio slash wave okay names specified again content transfer encoding is specified as base 64 and again that is followed by the uh, mime encoded or base 64 encoded mime data so this is basically how the um, data will the uh, the message will look like once you have mime encoded data embedded as part of the um, message so there could be different types of content um, that you could have so normally it's specified as a type and a subtype and there are other parameters which can be specified along with the uh, the headers so common th things that uh, that are used are we already saw this multi part mixed uh, which is used when you have multiple parts to the mail and then text could be text slash plain text slash html image you could have image slash jpeg image slash gif other image formats could be used then audio slash mp3 audio slash wave okay and similarly you can also have application specified for instance suppose you are sending a word file so you would specify it as application slash ms word okay or a message could be forwarded which means it's a forwarded email message is being sent as part of this mail so then the content type would be message and so on so other parameters that are used are already we saw this you have a boundary um, parameter which is used as a separator string then you could have character set specifications name specifications and so on so if you look at the mime um, content headers if you look at any smt uh, any message that you received and you look at the mime content in that you will find that these are the different header lines that are there which will be followed by the base 64 encoded content now you can also have what are called as composite messages um, that are being sent what we mean by this is that um, that that all the different parts of the message have to be viewed together this is typically used when you have html messages which contain graphics for instance if you have a html message which has number of uh, images in it for instance you would like to see all those images together so in these cases we use another content type which is called as multi part slash parallel so the parallel subtype here indicates that all the other parts that are part of this particular message have to be um, viewed in parallel so which means all of them will have to be interpreted together before they can be displayed so but other than that you will see that it's pretty much uh, similar to what we already saw you will have a start um, boundary followed by content type followed by the actual content again start boundary followed by content type followed by the content and so on okay so this is what we have in terms of uh, mime related uh, headers and the information that has to be specified as part of mime now um, another uh, extension that we also see to smtp which is uh, which has been done recently um, is that we have what is called as an extended smtp protocol which is specified in rfc's 2821 5321 and so on so uh, what we have here is that there are certain additional features that have been added to the simple mail transfer protocol so one is um, first of all you have a command these these are additional commands that are supported as part of this extended smtp 
So, first command that you have here is an EHLO, which, in, which stands for an extended hello, which is basically used to check whether the other server has support for the extended SMTP or not. So, if it has support for extended um, SMTP, then you can use these additional commands. Otherwise, you will go back to the basic SMTP protocol and use the commands which are used in basic SMTP protocol. So, additional commands that we have here are uh, go like this. Like you have a, a command called AUTH, which is, used, which is used to authenticate the client. Then you have start TLS, which is used um, when you want some secure, tra secure transfer of data to be done. So, in which case you may use something like transport layer security. So, if you are using transport layer security, this TLS protocol, then a start TLS message could be used. Um, another um, header that a line that is used, a command line that is used is a size uh, command. Now, this is used to exchange information on the size of the message being sent or the maximum size that can be accepted by the uh, by one side or the other. Okay, so, this can be used for instance when you want to split a large message and send it as multiple smaller messages and so on. So, this is a size message that has come up now. Uh, similarly, there is something called BDAT and chunking, which again is used to split messages into smaller parts for efficiency. So, you have a large message, big um, data for instance, and there you have multiple chunks of that that are being sent. So, we have these two headers which are used for that. And then we have something called pipelining. Now, this is used when you want to send the commands in, brand, in batches. Now, you, if you remember in the SMTP protocol, we typically looked at the client sending a command, uh, server responding, again the client sending a command, server responding and so on. But some of these commands actually could be sent together as a batch. That can be done only if pipelining is supported. So, you have this pipelining command to check whether pipelining is supported by the server, so that the client can server batches of uh, um, commands. Um, and then you also have something called 8 bit mine, which is to send 8 bit uh, mine data without actually converting it into 7 bit ASCII. So, this is also additional extension that has been provided in the um, extended SMTP protocol. Okay, so, these are additional things that have now been added, so that since we have different types of data that need to be sent, all these additions have come into place. Now, once we have looked at these different um, SMTP protocols and a kind, the kind of extensions to SMTP protocol, um, another important class of support protocols that we need to understand are the mail access protocols. Now, we said that SMTP is used to transfer data from a mail server to a receiver's mail server, from a user agent to the sender's mail server. And then again from the sender's mail server to the receiver's mail server. Now, when you when a user agent wants to, the receiver wants to access it from the receiver's mail server, so what is the protocol that he uses? Here actually there are three different options that are available, especially when the user agent is a, is accessing it as a remote um, user. So, the three protocols that we have for doing this access, one is called the POP uh, protocol, which is a post office protocol. Another is the IMAP protocol, which stands for internet mail access protocol. And the third is your web mail access, where you actually will be using your HTTP kind of protocol. Now, most of us who use Gmail or Hotmail or Yahoo Mail are actually familiar only with this third method of using uh, accessing mail, which is actually happening through the HTTP protocol. Remember, HTTP protocol is our web access protocol. So, we actually use the HTTP protocol to access the server on the other side, and which in turn contacts the mail server and gets us the information. So, we will take a look at how these three uh, protocols work um, in, a, in, a, in, a very, in a very brief manner. Okay. So, if you look at the POP and IMAP, so as I said, the, it is a, it's a simple protocol that runs between the client and the mail server. So, this uh, normally what you would have is on the client side, you will have some kind of, your, of a mail agent like your Outlook Express or Mozilla Mail or some such uh, program, which will talk to mail server using the POP or the IMAP protocols. Now, normally what you have is you will have uh, some kind of an authentication, so that the client, so that the server knows that it is a, it's a, it's a, it's a regular client or a authorized client who is trying to access the data. And then a set of transactions can take place between the two ends and then an update is done. So, normally we have these three phases, authentication, transaction and update, when you have data transferred between the uh, client and the mail server through either POP3 or IMAP. So, we will just take a look at these protocols. So, if you look at the um, POP protocol or the post office protocol, uh, we actually use version 3, so which is why it is called as the POP3 protocol. Now, it is a very simple protocol, again a simple plain text message protocol and it works at TCP port number 110 and if you want to use a secure version of P POP3, then 995 is the protocol that is, um, port number that is used. Now, if you look at the um, messages that are there, you again see that there are three phases, an authorization phase, a transaction phase and an update phase. So, if you look at um, the messages, again if I use a telnet for instance to uh, connect to a mail server at port number 110, it means that I am connected to the POP3 server. 
So once I'm connected to the pop3 server, the server will respond with a plus OK command. Now the OK is the response which comes back from the server along with the phrase which says for instance pop3 server ready. Then you follow up with specifying the username and then the password. So username is sent as Jim, then you get back a plus OK again from the server, then you send the password. Okay. If the password is invalid, you get back an error. If the password is correct, then you get a plus OK again. So once you get an OK message, now your authorization part is over, you can go into the transaction part. So in the transaction part, you can ask, you can ask for all the messages that you have to be listed. So what will happen is it will give you a list of messages with some message IDs that are there. Then you can retrieve these messages one by one. So you can say retrieve one, it will retrieve the message 628 and display it for you on your screen. Then you can, for instance, re once you've read the message, you may choose to delete it. So you can say delete one, or you can re retrieve the second message, delete it, and so on. Okay. And finally, we have a quit command, which is used to uh, terminate the POP3 session, and your server will respond with a plus OK and sign off from the session. Okay. So this is typically what we have in terms of the POP3 protocol. So as I said, uh, authorization phase, transaction phase, and then the update phase. So authorization phase consists of uh, client commands which use user and password and server responses are either plus OK or minus error. In the transaction phase, we have messages like list, retrieve, delete and so on. And the update phase is the quit when you actually quit and the, um, and the current state is, sta is uh, updated in the server. Um, this example that we just saw was actually an example of what is called as the download and delete mode because what happens in this case is the moment we downloaded a file or we retrieved a particular uh, message, we immediately sent a delete command to delete it from the server. So this is called as a download and delete mode that, uh, that is used. Now in this case what happens is that the moment you have downloaded the file in one of your clients, it is gone from your server. So if you try to access it from some other uh, client, let's say you log into some other machine and try to access your mail from there, you will not be able to see this anymore because you already deleted it from the server. So in those cases, POP3 also provides what is called as a download and keep mode. So if you have a download and keep mode, what it will do is it will keep the message on the server itself. That is, it will retrieve it, but it will not delete it from the server. Okay, so that is uh, another option that is normally provided on po in, the, in the POP3 protocol also. Uh, and in general, POP3 is a stateless protocol across sessions. Okay, that is another uh, point to note about the POP3 protocol. Now, coming to the IMAP protocol, which is the Internet Mail Access Protocol, uh, this was basically um, introduced following the POP3 protocol to cater to some of the disadvantages that were there in the POP3 protocol. So in the POP3 protocol, for instance, as we just saw, in, if you are moving from one machine to another machine, you will, um, and you try to access from multiple places, it is very difficult for you to, uh, if you, uh, to organize the messages that you have looked at and that you have not looked at and so on. So to provide all this organization and to be able to um, view parts of messages, not just the full message, okay, to add many more additional features in terms of how the messages are retrieved. Uh, the IMAP protocol was introduced. So if you look at the IMAP protocol, which is the internet mail access protocol, what this allows you to do is it allows you to manage multiple folders on the server. That is you can have, you can organize your mail on the server itself and you can kind of access these folders at your uh, convenience and at your, um, according to your time. Okay? And you can access it from multiple places as well. So it gives you flexibility in terms of accessing the messages that you have on your server. So, um, and also what the another advantage that you have with the IMAP protocol is that it is more bandwidth efficient compared to the POP3 protocol because you can search messages on the server without actually downloading them. In the POP3 protocol, you will have to download all the messages before you could uh, search for anything. But with the IMAP protocol, you can search for messages on the server without actually downloading them. And you can also download just the message header. So, you do not have to actually get all your uh, complete message, the, um, the different attachments and so on, only the message headers can be downloaded and you can selectively download the different attachments that you have. Okay? So one part of a multi-part my message alone can be downloaded. See, there, these are certain advantages and certain uh, features that are, pro that are provided as part of the IMAP protocol. Okay? So uh, obviously this maintains much more state about the mailbox than the POP3 protocol. So it's a, it, it has a lot of state information that is maintained. And each message that you that you have seen, that you have looked at, right, can be marked as seen, answered, recent, deleted, and so on. So with the help of these um, uh, markings, you can kind of manage your mail better. Okay? That's the idea with the uh, with the IMAP protocol. Okay? And here again, the delete. Even if you delete a message, there is a de there is a, a delete option. So even if you delete a message, it's actually not erased until the client issues a expunge command. So you actually 
uh, a delete message will go into your trash, but will not be purged from your uh, from your trash unless you give the expunge command. Okay, so these are certain additional features that you have in the IMAP protocol and compared to the POP3 protocol. So if you look at the um, different states that IMAP goes through, again you will see that there are um, th three, four states that we have in the IMAP protocol as well. So initially, before you, when you open the connection, it is in a not authenticated state. Okay, the, so then following opening the connection, you will have an authentication state where you have multiple commands that could be sent. Now, in terms of how the commands are sent, again, it is very similar to the POP3 protocol. That is, everything is sent only as simple ASCII messages, right? So, since you have uh, ASCII messages as the commands that are being sent, right? So, you have these different commands that could be used when you are in the authenticated state. You can select a message, you can examine a message, you can create something, you can delete something, you can rename um, a folder, right? you can delete message, you can delete folders, you can subscribe to a particular um, folder, you can unsubscribe from it, you can list only a particular folder, okay? you can get the status of the um, different folders that you have, you can append something, okay? all these are different um, commands that are available for you. So once you have selected a folder, then within that selected folder, you can do things where you can check what is there, you can close, you can expunge, you can search, you can fetch some data from there, you can store something, you can copy something. Uh, okay, there is also something called a unique identifier for you to be able to um, uniquely identify a particular message and do some operation on that message alone. Okay, so all these different things become possible when you are in the um, selected phase. Uh, the, the last phase is the logout phase when the actual logout takes place and you are out of the uh, and you have stopped your communication using the IMAP protocol. Okay. So these are the different um, states that are there as part of the IMAP protocol. The IMAP is actually quite a complex uh, protocol, but it is in the sense that there are a number of commands that are supported that need to be uh, handled. But uh, in terms of usage, it gives us a lot of flexibility. So that is why we find that uh, most of these are the uh, mail agents now will use the IMAP protocol and support for IMAP has become very, very common. The uh, third mail access that we talked about is our web email access. So here what happens is that the web browser becomes the email reader. So we do not have any special email reader program like the um, like your Outlook Express or whatever. Your email, your web browser itself becomes the web, e web email reader. Okay? It is a web based email reader that you have. So now what happens here is that there is a lot of processing that will have to be done on the web server. Remember that after all you are using the HTTP protocol. So your web uh, client, your web browser basically will be talking to a web server. So it is your web server now that has to at the back end connect to a mail server and access data from the mail server and deliver it to you through the web, uh, to your web browser. Okay? So we have many commercial web mails like your Yahoo mail, Gmail and so on. There are also free web mails available, okay, um, for example, squirrel mail is one such thing which is available which can be used by organization to set up their own web based um, um, email servers. Okay. So how does this web mail actually work? No? How does it process your inbox? How does it delete messages? How does the web mail send email as you because you as in the sense that whatever you are logged in as, right? So all these things are a little um, challenging with respect to how web email works. But if you look at it, it is actually um, not very difficult in the sense that we know that we can use the HTTP protocol for the web browser to talk to the web server and it is only a question of determining how the web server will talk to a back end a mail server. Okay? So here again there are two approaches that are normally used. Um, you can have a situation where the web server and the email server are on the same host which means they are on the same machine in which case uh, the Obviously, in which case the web server can directly access the uh, email server using CGI or some other backend programs. Okay? And the uh, backend processing is specific to how the email is stored and managed on the system. So that is something which is left to the system designer assets. We really do not have to worry about that. Okay? So this is one approach. The second approach is when there is a mail server which is kind of um, on a separate machine compared to the web server. In which case what you could do is between this web server and the mail server, you could use either IMAP or the POP3 protocol. Either of these two protocols could be used between these two and, um, and your web server will actually be talking to the mail server using the IMAP protocol, retrieving the messages for you and sending it to you as, uh, as part of the, as, as, a web, uh, as a web page, right? So this is what happens. Uh, now this case you, you can see is a, is a little more uh, portable and a lot and gives you a, gives you a lot more, lot more of flexibility. Because you don't this your um, mail server and your uh, web server design are kind of now isolated from each other. Okay, so so that gives you that the, the that separation gives you the flexibility that we can look for. 
but the disadvantage of this will be that there is um, more overhead okay uh, but less cpu load on the web server because you see that this has to do an additional work of the imap uh, running the imap protocol to contact the mail server and then get the information form it into a web page and give it to you okay this is basically what happens so actually when you log in for instance using your um, gmail protocol or whatever so what would actually be happening is the moment you log in with your username and password so what is displayed to you you get an inbox right with all your different uh, messages that are listed and so on what actually happens is that the with the moment you send your login and your login is approved right the, remember that the, when you do the login it is uh, your uh, smtp protocol you, what is being sent is only part of the http protocol so when you log in you are talking to your to your web to your mail server through the web server so the web server is the one which receives your uh, web page extracts the information from it and passes it to the email server and then the email server is the one which gives back the response that is constructed by your web server okay as a web page and passed on to you so we are actually talking only using the http protocols this is a very interesting uh, feature to note when we are using web based email okay so to summarize what we have looked at um, in uh, this video lecture is that we have looked at some extensions to email the different uh, mime extensions and then we have looked at how mail access is uh, carried out in these three methods pop3 imap and web access okay so thank you